Hey everyone, welcome to the Capital City Bourbon Show. This is your host, Luke, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Alex and John. We're thrilled to be here with you all today, so grab yourself a glass of whiskey and come join us on the porch. Welcome to yet another episode of the Capital City Bourbon Show. This is your host, Luke, and I'm here in beautiful Tallahassee, Florida with my co-host, John Hill. Uh, We also are joined by our co-host, Alex Patel, who's coming from us all the way down in beautiful Miami, Florida. How's the weather down there, Alex? Oh, man, it's a beautiful day. Sun is shining. The water is looking good. You know, no complaints. I see you got that cigar lit already. Uh, Absolutely. I am jealous. (laughs) Absolutely. Everyone, it's a testament to Alex's passion for whiskey that he's always traveling all over the world, but yet somehow he managed to manages to have his whiskey with him and he joins us for this podcast. So that that's love. I right actually there. flew down with these samples that you sent me, Luke, uh, and I I vacuum sealed it and walked it through TSA security. <laughs> the, the dude looked at me like I was crazy. I thought we gotta record a podcast. These samples are coming with me. Hey, they understand this is important stuff. Absolutely. So we're, we're thrilled to be here again today. And as we promised in our original episode, we have another great episode lined up for you all today with a, another great guest. Um, we are joined today by Will Shragus, who's the National Director for Barrel Craft Spirits. Uh, he's here today to talk to us about what's happening at Barrel. And uh, of course, we have uh, three great whiskeys that we're going to be sampling today and, and sharing with you all. Will, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, thank you so much for having me. I uh, this time of year, as a as a whiskey supplier or a producer, you spend most of your time putting out just like the most unpredictable logistics fires to make sure all the stores and restaurants and such get their whiskey before Christmas. And uh, the opportunity to take an hour out of the day to just talk to people about whiskey and maybe have a drink myself is much welcome. So. Uh, I know one of us is smoking a cigar on the beach and it's not me, but it, it feels like a vacation for at least an hour for me. Well, that's good to hear. Now, you know, Will, you're coming to us from um, New York, right? Uh, yeah. So I am based in Brooklyn, New York, uh, about halfway between JFK and LaGuardia, but our company is based in Louisville, Kentucky. When I started working for Joe Beatrice, the owner and founder of Barrel, uh, geez, five years ago now, uh, it became pretty clear that as we were bringing the brand from three states to what is now 46 states, I was going to be on the road a lot. And so uh, I don't know if anyone who's listening or any of the three of you have ever flown in and out of Louisville, Kentucky, but it is not a cheap airport. Uh, There's a lot of industry there that doesn't care how much plane tickets cost. (laughs) And so uh, Joe very kindly said, as long as you're close to an airport that can get you to Kentucky, you can live anywhere you want. And so uh, I stayed in my apartment in Brooklyn, and he, here I am five years later. Oh, that's great. Still here, yeah. Well, well, we have some great whiskey to drink today, and I know we already have it poured and are ready to go, but before we jump into that, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you're doing for Barrel? Yeah, so uh, again, I started with Barrel about five years ago now. Uh, before that, Right before that, I worked for a company at the time that was called uh, the House of Agricole. Uh, but it is now called Spearbomb. It's an importer of uh, really traditional French Caribbean rums. Uh, they now represent some rums from St. Lucia as well. Interesting. Uh, and uh, that was really amazing for me as a, a career learning experience because fancy rum, everyone wants to meet with you, but uh, it's it's a tough sell. And so you really learn the the grind of representing a brand when it's expensive, dry Martinique has rum. Um, before that, I had worked for a, a retailer in New York called Zaki's, which is a retail and auction house, mostly specializing in fine wine. And that's actually where I met Joe. Uh, Zaki's was the second store in the country to bring barrel in. And so I met Joe when I was the spirits buyer, and he came to sell me the whiskey. Uh, and we just sort of stayed in touch for a long time. Uh, and he always kind of hinted to me that one day he was going to hire me. And it feels like I'm not sure if you can tell from my voice or not, but from the people that can see me on the screen right now, I'm not an old guy, but it feels like a lifetime ago that, that uh, I met Joe and he was selling batch one of barrel. Um, and then before that I, I was a small, yeah. And so I worked in restaurants, but um, 
I am not gracious enough to work full time in restaurants. And so to all of my friends and compatriots that are are still or at least until so many challenging things happen this year, we're still working in restaurants. I admire and am wowed by the ability to keep a smile on in front of people so much when you, when you're serving. Uh, yeah. But now I've been with Barrow for about five years. Um, I uh, help manage the sales team. We're up to six people around the country that look after different markets. Uh, and then I also work with Joe and our chief whiskey scientist, Trip Stimson, uh, and uh, our single barrel program manager, Nick Christensen, who also sits on the blending team. And uh, it's really the three of them in Kentucky, but they allow me to pretend I'm part of the team also. And and so I sit on the sort of product development team with them. Well, that's awesome. Um, and so as the company has grown from just batches of bourbon to bourbon, whiskey, rye, rum, private release whiskey, private release rum, private release bourbon, single barrel rye, single barrel Canadian rye, single barrel bourbon, all of the different expressions. Uh, my job has more become a little bit of a chief of staff role where I, I need to know what's going on on the compliance side so that the sales side can work. And I need to know what's going on in the sales side so I can help inform the product design side to bring whiskeys that people are excited about to the market. Um, what's been so cool about working with Barrel as we grow is there's no BS story behind Barrel. Joe's inspiration was, I love tasting cask strength whiskeys and thinking about why they're special and different from each other. And I'm going to design a brand and a producer that brings that experience to as many people as possible. And so we really get to come on podcasts like this and talk to whiskey collectors and talk to people who are just starting to drink whiskey and think about what's exciting in in America and the world in terms of whiskey and like really dive into respecting the traditions and also pushing the envelope on innovation at the same time. Yeah. That's one thing I, I noticed about barrel, you know, in the, in the years that I've been involved with whiskey and, and really considered myself a connoisseur is I've been amazed at the number of products I see from barrel. If I get lucky and I walk into a store, you know, I'll see five or six, but all these different blends and finishes and different barrel proof. I mean, it, it really blew me away to see so many different products coming from one company. And obviously I haven't tried all of them, but I've tried many and, and I really have been impressed with just the quality of the product and, and the fact that you can put out so many that, and still maintain that level of quality. I think that's really impressive. Yeah. So our company was built on like two core principles or pillars, or we now call them foundations because the metaphor of building on pillars doesn't really work very well. Um, uh, the first is that we are concerned with making the best spirits we can at any moment, no matter what. And we are not concerned with making the same spirits or being able to recreate them. Uh, and the, I guess, impetus or the, the vision behind that from Joe is if your target is the same thing as last time, your target cannot be the best thing I can make. Uh, there's no way to have that. I imagine, you know, baking cookies and using the rest, same recipe every time. The cookies are never going to get any better on purpose. But if you learn things from every time you bake the cookies and you, you take maybe the same recipe, but you use sea salt instead of ionized salt, it's going to be better. Um, and the same thing goes for producing and blending whiskeys that you, you need to be careful. You need to learn lessons and use them as you make new decisions and, uh, you know, work on sourcing and work on, on barrel finishing, work on barrel exchanges and, and rotations. Uh, but if all you're trying to do is make it so no one notices the difference between one, one release and the next release, then the next release is never going to be better than the last one. That's, that's a great philosophy. Uh, it certainly creates a lot of uh, logistics and compliance work for the company that would not have existed if we only had one whiskey out at a time, but uh, it's a labor of love at this point. The second foundation, which is a lot simpler, is we only make things at cask strength. The ingredients we use are what came out of the barrel, and that has to do with the way that Joe enjoyed drinking whiskey at cask strength uh, and the way that, that he felt whiskey drinkers around the country and world really appreciated drinking whiskey. And a little bit of it is because if you have absolutely no rules, it's kind of hard to know where to start. So at least we know that nothing's getting knocked down as an ingredient. Everything is, is an ingredient at cast strength. And so 
everything else we do sort of gets built on those two foundations or principles. Uh, when we started, we were just doing bourbon. Well, our company used to be called Barrel Bourbon. And we joke that bourbon is our vodka because it sells itself and it keeps the lights on for us. But uh, as we grow, uh, we, we started with moving into the American whiskey category because there were a lot of really interesting spirits that had been declassified for one reason or another. And then we moved into the rye category, which uh, was pretty obvious, I think, uh, based on what we were doing and, and the sources that we were working with. I think everyone expected a rye from us at some point, and we did. Um, and uh, we moved into the rum category for a while as well, and we still make these like really fancy, very high-proof, sort of intense but delicious cask-strength Caribbean rum blends. Um, but what we've started doing more and more is it, within that whiskey category is using bourbon as an ingredient, uh, both itself to make blends of bourbon where everything is a bourbon, but then also uh, to be able to use bourbon and rye as structural ingredients with whiskeys that otherwise don't, wouldn't have a name. So they're just whiskey, but they allow us to peel away that, that and we'll talk about this a little bit when we taste the, the rye batch number three. They allow us to, to sort of move away from the canon of, um, of bourbon and American rye while still using the like delicious ingredients that are bourbon and rye, uh, but we get to like free our minds a little bit in what we do with them. Yeah, no, let's, where are we going to start? You, you guide us through this journey. Um, so I actually think if it's okay with you, we can pour the first, I, I like talking about whiskey when I've got whiskey in my glass, if that's fine. Uh, I'd actually like to start with rye batch number three. Um, Nick and I uh, joke argue about this a lot because when you're tasting spirits and there's a big variety, most people will go low proof to high proof. Uh, and then beyond that, people often go uh, not sweet to sweet or not peat to peat or both, depending on what type of tasting they're doing. And I generally agree with that. Uh, however, everything we do is at cask strength and the human palate is not really going to taste something at like, I don't know, 112 proof and think it's easy even if it's the lowest proof thing on the table uh and so i like to start with rye batch three when i'm doing this particular flight of, of rye batch three one of the batches of bourbon and dovetail uh because rye, the rye is actually the most abrasive of the three um it's the middle proof but it's the most abrasive of the three uh so it's going to kick your ass anyway oh, excuse me i kick your butt i'm not sure what the no, no, swearing. listen, this is, this is not a PG-rated podcast, so you, no worries. Oh, thanks for telling me, Luke. I've been biting my tongue. <laughs> I I find the bourbon and the dovetail so interesting and unique in how soft they are for their proof that if you taste them first, you don't notice it because the second one is always going to taste softer anyway. And so it's almost like if it's going to hurt anyway, get it out of the way, hurt yourself with the rye, and then you know, show off how smooth the other two are. So, uh, so this is batch three and this comes in at one sixteen point seven. Can you tell us anything about the mash bill or, um, anything specific about the, the juice itself? Yeah. So this is a, this is a blend of three different producers of rye, although there was a couple of different lots from two of them. Uh, the base of it is the Indiana, and I'm not going to say the name of the distillery out loud, but you all know what I'm talking about. Sure. Uh, the 95.5 mash bill that everyone loves from that uh, from them. Uh, mostly seven-year-olds, a little bit of four-year-olds. We find with that particular mash bill, but really almost anything coming out of Indiana, there's this amazing peak at like three and a half to five years where it's still pretty distillate forward. It's not as oaked, but it's it doesn't taste young anymore. And then there's a little bit of a plateau. There's another peak at like seven to nine years old where it's not oak driven, uh, but there's this like evolving or transitionary period of the barrels where they're all very different again for a little while. And then beyond that, it becomes very variable. You've got amazing old barrels. You've got nasty old barrels. Uh, beyond nine years or so with bourbon, so much of it has to do with the tree that was used to make the barrel, the condition of the barrel being charred, uh, and then also the warehouse placement that there's so much variability beyond that. Um, so with this, even though the base of it was that Indiana seven year old that we love working with, we loved the freshness and the mintiness of some of the four year old barrels. So we used a couple of those as well. 
uh, the second ingredient, which is the smallest volumetrically, but I think is uh, important to mention, is a 100% malted rye single malt from Poland. No kidding. So it's made like a single malt scotch, except instead of barley, they use rye. They malt all of it, and it's a double pot still. Wow. Um, and there's not a whole lot of that in here, but uh, it's important, I think, to point out because there is this maltiness or what I often get is like um, like underripe stone fruit. Like if you ever like have been into like a nectarine a couple, two day, a couple days too early and it's like it's still li- delicious, but there's like a tartness to it a little bit or a, if anyone's a cook, like a pectin kind of quality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I find that to be extremely pronounced on that uh on that Polish and, and it, it pulls through here. And I think it brings a, a really beautiful fruit note, uh, especially to the nose that you do not get out of American rye and you do not get out of Canadian rye. Um, the third ingredient, which to me, even though it is not the driver at all, and I, I find that it is the hardest to find flavor profile wise, but it is equally as important to the structure of the whiskey is a uh, 14 year old high proof Canadian rye. Um, the reason I find that so important in this is uh, there's very little oak on that rye. That rye is austere and lean and distillate driven. And it has that uh, green apple note that such amazing Canadian whiskeys often have. It has a little bit of this like uh, light honey or if anyone's ever had like the really pretentious but delicious like fermented or like fancy Manuka honey type things out of a grocery store. Um, that nose on them, that like slightly tart honey. And the reason that that's so important to this whiskey to us is American rye, specifically Indiana rye, is sort of objectively delicious. If you like whiskey, you like Indiana rye all the time. Everyone likes it. There's a reason that that 95 mash, five mash bill is so famous. Uh, but one of the tragedies of American rye is you have to use 100% virgin oak. And so it is impossible to make an American rye that is old, that is not oak driven in its flavor profile. It's just, it's illegal. Um, and so by declassifying this out of American rye, calling it a world rye whiskey uh, and using older, but less oaky ryes to sort of strip away the dominance of the oak character, it allows you to get a little bit more of the the spirit from Indiana without only getting oak out of it. So it sort of gives you what gives you what you want out of an Indiana rye while still uh, letting the, that like beautiful pectiny nose from the Polish rye and that like kind of sour, delicious, tart green apple nose from the Canadian rye like poke through a little bit. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the nose on this rye was a lot of fun and, you know, I definitely got that pronounced minty note, but, you know, you, when you brought up the Polish rye, I mean, that note is, after you said it, really what's jumping out the most to me on the nose. Uh, and describing it as a, uh, an underripe nectarine, I think, is just spot on. And I can't get that note out of my nose now that you said it. And it, it's it's lovely. And, it you know, it reminds me of some of the uh, whistle pig picks we've done the past, you know, two years. We've Market Square here in Tallahassee does a lot of whistle pig picks. And I definitely get some of those same rye notes from that, you know, Alberta and Hiram Walker. I know they've, they've done both and get some of those notes, but it's really nice, well-rounded on the nose. And um, I mean, really just so smooth. I, I don't find it abrasive or harsh at all. And I, granted, I drink a lot of high proof whiskey, but you know, I find this one exceptionally smooth and flavorful. I don't know if anyone disagrees with me. No, it's <clears throat> look, it's it's nice and warm right as you sip it. But you know, what I find unique about this as opposed to other ryes is that you kind of get that on the sides and the back of your tongue that on other ryes, you know, you, you get that sart that tartness in there. And this one just seems to break across the palate and it ends off super sweet and it just goes down sweet. Uh, I mean it's it, it it's definitely interesting. I mean, uh it's crazy how they went all the way to Poland to find the grain, but I mean, you can definitely tell the difference of however they're doing their grain, their rye grain over there. I mean, that's, that's an interesting mouthfeel and, and flavor profile. I mean, it's, it's nice and sweet at the finish. Yeah. I, uh, I wish I could take a recording of that and take it back to the blending room when we were starting to put this together because the, 
the goal, the sort of the treatment, if you will, when we were put, well, when you were putting together the first blends was how do we give everyone who loves Indiana rye everything they want while still giving people who drink every type of whiskey an interesting whiskey experience? And uh, one of the things we talked about was how linear American rye is, both because of how tart and spicy the flavor profile is, but also because of the oak tannin, the bitterness that makes it it makes it a little sticky or uh, what we often call the tannin block, which is uh, in the mid palate. So it's like you taste something, you get all the flavor. And then before you get to the finish of the whiskey, while it's still sort of there and, and present in your brain, a lot of rye and a lot of bourbon dries out. And it's because the, it has enough sweetness to carry through the bitterness on the front palate, but it doesn't have enough sweetness to carry through the bitterness on the mid palate. And that's, not bad. That's part of the journey of drinking a bourbon. Right. It's that it, it like, it's easy. And then it kind of slaps you in the face halfway through the experience. Uh, but there's a beauty in whiskeys that find a way to circumvent that tannin wall, uh, either by having secondary finishes that bring some sweetness or some acidity, which we'll get to in the dovetail. Or in the case of this, it was just pulling out the oak a little bit by blending things that were less oaky into it without right. dominating the flavor profile. Um, so I, I just, I, your, your analysis of this is what we were going for. So thank you. Um, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. It's really exceptionally well balanced and, and that, that, that thick gooey honey note at the end, that really just kind of lingers and, and creates that great mouthfeel is, is really pleasant. And, and like you pointed out with so many American rice that we've had the opportunity to taste, you know, th- those tannins, can be very unpleasant and, and really just kind of stifle any other flavor development that you're looking for in the finish. And, and I, you know, we don't get that at all with that rye and then really just very pleasant overall. Well, a big part of the experience is in this particular tasting is what you're, what you're telling us and what you were trying to achieve and, and how you achieved it. And I'm wondering how this is landing at the consumer level where it's uh, served in a bar and the guy doesn't know the backstory and, and uh, what is, what, what are you getting from the guy that doesn't really know what's going into it and what your goals were with this? What's your consumer saying? So Rye Batch 3 was uh, an interesting journey for us on the sales team because it was a big batch. When we produce a blend that's going to be a national release, it's usually anywhere from about 1,800 six packs to like 4,000 six packs. And this one was like 3,000. It was, it was pretty big. Um, similarly, the number of people around the country who like to talk about bourbon and like to talk about rye is pretty similar. The number of people who go out and buy a bottle of bourbon and a bottle of rye are not similar at all. The uh, depth of bourbon drinker is exponentially bigger in America than the depth of rye drinker, partially because rye is such a cocktail forward category. And bourbon is, there's still so, so much of bourbon is enjoyed like the way that I like to drink spirits, which is just like by itself. Um, and so uh, when we release something, because of our distribution network, because of the like sort of organic growth of our company, there's, 1500 to 2000 six packs that we know exactly where they're going. Like we, we know the stores that buy a six pack of everything we release. We know the chains who like to have us on the shelf. We know the bars that like to buy the things that we make. Uh, we know the websites that have email lists of people that collect our. And so there's a little bit of a new release. We know where it's going experience for us when we've got something that's 3000 cases it's that last thousand six packs of who's going to sell out of it and order it again. And how quickly are they going to do it? That is very regionally specific and category specific. And it, it's a really, it's a fun, but scary thing to look back on to try to analyze, did we do something better or did the pro was the product better or did the product just speak to different people? Or was there a way that we spoke about it that, convinced people to take a chance on it. Um, what we have found with Rye Batch 3, which I'm really proud of, even though it took a little bit longer to realize than some other launches we've done, is 
people who are spirit drinkers, who drink bourbon, who drink scotch, who drink brandy, who drink mezcal, who drink fancy eau de vie, who just like want distillate, all seem to be exceedingly impressed with my batch three. That it, it keeps getting written about in like the magazines and stuff that write about wine and write about beer and write about shochu and write about whiskey, like do all of it. It's like a spirits drinkers spirit. Uh, because it's an $80 MSRP, $85 MSRP, and because it's not 100% Indiana, and because our company is is barrel bourbon in our like core, even though we go to buy barrel craft spirits for the past couple of years, uh, Rye Batch 3 took a little bit longer to sort of catch on. And so it's been out for a little more than a year, but the amount of interviews we've gotten asked to, to talk about it, the stores that are buying it more right now, the reviews have, they've escalated in the past like three or four months. It's almost like it took a year for people to find it. Um, so we're down to about 600 bottles in our warehouse now. Uh, whereas uh, there was a little bit of a gap that the pipeline got filled and we sort of had to wait for people to find it. Um, and I, I think it, you just learn little nuances of, of which categories do well where so often. Il- Illinois, for instance, seems to love this whiskey. Um, but then there's some other places that that move through bourbon and move through American whiskey and move through rum much faster than they do rye. How much of it is uh, moving through uh, the lounges and the bars as opposed to the uh, liquor stores? Uh, so in general, our company does, I mean, and 2020 is skewing the numbers a lot and we have grown a hundred percent in 2020 in terms of our just like straight volume of sales. And so uh, it's hard for me to answer that because I have no comparable year and 90% of our business was in, you know, online sales and, and, and liquor store sales this year. Okay. Um, but uh, in general, we, that number would be more like 70% um, through liquor stores and, and online. And uh, rye is generally a little bit more skewed towards the, the restaurants and the bars. Yeah. Uh, and, and we can move on to the other two because I know we have, I've, I've lots to say to everything, but uh, yeah, the, the rye, I also, for people who are stuck at home and they like making somewhat easy but fun cocktails, this particular rye, and even within our portfolio, this product, uh, if you like the old-fashioned build, which is probably the easiest to execute of all the s- classic cocktails at home because it's spirit and a sweetening, sweetening agent and a bittering agent. So it, you can buy bitters at a grocery store. You can make simple syrup at home. You can use the sugar. There's a lot of variability in an old-fashioned. Um, this particular rye works very well in old fashions. It also blends really well with other spirits. And so I have really enjoyed doing like a half cognac, half rye old fashioned with this or a half aged rum, half rye old fashioned with it. Uh, I think that it, it, because it has a lot of proof, but it's not so dominant. It just like, it holds its own really nicely next to other things. Um, and before before the pandemic, we actually saw a lot of cocktail bars using it, not so much as the base of their cocktail on their cocktail list, but as a modifier in a cocktail. I think that was the reason for my question. I can see a uh, bartender having a ball with this and Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to put it in front of somebody and and tell them what you're tasting. I think that I think a bartender would love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's got some versatility. Yeah. So we're going to go to bourbon batch 26 now. Yeah, this uh, the bourbon. I've I've had several of the bourbon batch releases, and <laughs> I've never been disappointed. So I'm not worried about this one at all. Yeah, I uh, I'm really in love with batch 26 right now. Batch 25 was a hard act to follow. Batch 25 was the first time we had ever used weeded bourbon in one of our blends, and so we just had a, a bit of a feeding frenzy on that because I'm sure. The four of you and and people listening uh, are aware of how much America seems to love weeded bourbon these days. But um, batch twenty six for us, it's a, a blend of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Indiana bourbons. It's uh, nine to fifteen years old, and uh, it has this like milk chocolate, almost like chocolate covered cherry sort of note to it that 
uh, Joe and Tripp and Nick really loved. And we were actually hoping to make this batch a little bit bigger because it came out at the beginning of October, which is the busiest season for us. And they gave me a call one day and, and they were like, it's smaller than we thought, but it's perfect. So we're cutting it right now. Um, which is not the most fun call as the person who looks after the sales team. But uh, it also is, it's really an inspiring call to get from someone who to have Joe, the owner of the company say like, I'm willing to make sales more difficult to make sure the whiskey is as good as it can be. Um, so it's like a nice call to get also. Uh, well, that's, that's important. I mean, cause ultimately all that matters is, is what's in the bottle and you know, that's a hard decision to have to make, but if, if the whiskey is your passion, uh, you know, that's the right decision in my opinion. Um, so the things about this that I think are really interesting, especially in comparison to the rye. Uh, first of all, to me, there's this chocolatey note, this like creamy chocolatey note, especially on the nose. It comes out a little bit more like cocoa nips to me on the palate. It's not quite as sweet on the palate as it is on the nose. Um, but next to that is this stone fruit, but not sharp and not underripe the way that the rye had. It's a much more like candied peach or overripe peach kind of stone fruit note to me. Uh, but then when you sip it, even though it is sweeter on the front palate, it dries out and it leaves you with a little bit of scratchiness on the back of your tongue. And that is because it's bourbon. It's a hundred percent new oak. There is that oak bitterness to it. Uh, that is structurally part of the bourbon experience that we so deliberately blended out of the rye and so deliberately leave in the bourbons. Uh, bourbon's not, even though people say that they like smooth bourbon, bourbon is not supposed to be a really easy drink. It's supposed to be a like kind of rustic experience when you're drinking it. It's designed to not be romantic and perfect and polished. It's supposed to be a little bit visceral. Um, and so one thing I really like about this batch is it, it has so much complexity if you're looking for it, but it's, it's also just like a really bourbony bourbon, if that makes sense. And there's so many bourbons in, in the world right now or in that are produced to try to push the boundaries of bourbon in one way or another that like, it almost forgets what made bourbon so popular in the first place. Well, um, see, coming back to this, as much as I love the rye, when you talk about how this is like a, a bourbony bourbon, that's exactly why I love it. Cause I love rye. I'm a big rye fan and the rye we just tasted was wonderful, but when I taste the bourbon, there's just something about it that feels right. Uh, it's it gives you that huge Kentucky hug. The proof is right in my sweet spot, you know, just shy of 120. You know, that's the proof I love. And I definitely love getting the oak in there. Uh, I know some people aren't fans of oak or they think it's a little too abrasive at times, but this reminds me why I love bourbon, uh, you know, just tasting it. I don't want to hate on oak. I love oak. And also the oak gives brings the sweetness and the complexity and the color and all of those things with bourbon. I think what's difficult in blending bourbon is all the things we love about bourbon come from the oak. And also all of the things that make things bitter come from the oak. Uh, one of the fallacies in the whiskey world is that bourbon is a romantic distillate. Bourbon's made out of corn, and it's generally made on very large, wonderful, but pieces of machinery. It's a factory product. And when you use oak, you are taking the good and the bad, and the good and the bad also evolve in the barrel as it's aging. And it's important to select barrels that will complement one another to tease out the things that you like from everything. And so uh, I know that like in this batch, for instance, there's this like slightly fresher nine-year-old that we really like the front palette of that. It still has some fruit in it. And then there's this 14, 15 year old blend that Nick uh, calls the secret sauce. She like, it, it's one of a lot of aspects of blending that, that she sort of pioneered with us since she started like a year and a half ago, which is barrels that are old and had very low proofs coming out of the barrel that are, delicious but a little bit flat and we vat them and we just use they just make everything better because it they're not good at being the base of a whiskey but they don't dominate anything and they help you sort of like smooth out the rough edges of blends that are otherwise really flavorful but maybe not 
easy to drink. Um, and then in the middle of it, we have this 10 and this 13 year old, like sort of over oaked, like high Rick, astringent backbone that would not be good by itself, but it's like, it gets the fruit flavor of the nine year old and then it gets softened out by the 14 and 15. You know, that's, uh, it, um, that's, it, it's great that you said it like that. Cause when, when I was first trying it, I was like, man, this is like a roller coaster. You know, now, now it makes sense, right? There's different experiences to this. Like, right, when I first took a sip, it kind of reminded me of, like, Curacao notes. So, like, I was thinking about, like, that Willet XCS cast that they, that they bottled many years ago. But then, you know, once I let it sit out here for a couple of minutes, put a drop of water in, in those chocolate notes, and the creaminess really just popped through, and it tapers off all of the heat. I mean, it's the it's definitely a great blend. I mean, it's, it's changing flavor profiles pretty rapidly. And I think that's a unique experience that not all juices are offering. Well, it was just one thing we continually are impressed by. And, you know, we're the, the group that we are part of has been in whiskey for a long time. And, you know, we always are learning, but just the art of blending, how it continues to amaze me. Because as you were talking about taking these great barrels that maybe not are great for a base whiskey, but to try soften edges and strike that perfect balance, you know, that, that's just so interesting to me. And I, I'm continually amazed by master blenders and what they're able to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's something I, I wish I could try. I don't think I could do it, but I would love to try it because uh, I just am amazed by it. What's so impressive to me about Nick and Trip and Joe and so many other blenders around the world is when you are tasting a whiskey as an ingredient, you have to think about so many different little structural and or flavor aspects about it and which ones you want to keep and which ones you don't want to keep and then match it with other ingredients that will keep the things you want and not keep the things you want. And certain flavors and certain structural components are more pervasive than other things. So uh, it is really hard to put together a really citrusy bourbon blend because you're going to loot that note is so delicate. The like lemony or like orange zesty note in bourbon and uh, you basically need all of the ingredients to have that in order for the final product to have that. You're going to lose it if you don't. Whereas putting together a very vanilla forward bourbon, which is also really delicious, is kind of an easier puzzle because if half the barrels are really vanilla forward, the entire blend is going to be really vanilla forward. And to think about Barrels that are actually really boring, but they will not change anything, are sometimes amazing ingredients because it's like, you know what? We need to be able to make more of this without screwing up the thing we like. What's an extremely imbalanced kind of nondescript barrel? That's actually potentially a really important ingredient to us. Or a barrel that's way over-oaked so that we can bring structure into a blend without changing the flavor profile is potentially a really important ingredient to us. Uh, barrels that are high proof or low proof are potentially really important ingredients to us if we want to try to adjust proof for heat without, you know, we're cast strength. So uh, especially in the bourbon world where there's no, we do a lot of finishing now, which gives us some, uh, some control and some flexibility. But in the bourbon world, we can't do that. So it's like every ingredient we're looking at, we're looking not only at the way it tastes, but also at the way it's going to affect everything else. Which uh, one of the questions I, I get asked often, which it took until this summer really to have an answer for, is what's the definition of small batch? Because there's no legal definition to small batch and almost everyone puts it on their label now. And to me... The definition of a small batch is when the addition of one more barrel will change what the final product is. If you can make a, a blend that is so delicate out of 100 barrels that the 101st barrel will change it, it's still a small batch. If you've got a, a set of 50 barrels 
that is so robust and powerful that you don't really you can just add as much as you want and it won't it's not a small batch anymore it's just a 50 barrel blend um and that's why even though we make a lot of products like the dovetail that we're going to try that we now produce over and over again out of ingredients that we make um everything we do is still what we call a small batch because we are, we are still at the point where we're blending it to the point where we are making it as good as we can possibly make it in that situation. Uh, and then kind of s- starting over the next time, if you will. Now the, um, fruit, the fruit forward uh, catches my attention and I'm getting that on both of these. Is, is that is something that you're trying to achieve with everything you're putting out? I don't think it's something we're specifically trying to achieve, but if you follow the brand a lot, there's a little bit of a house style that just comes from Joe's preferences in whiskey. And Joe definitely likes the slightly juicier, more fruit forward style of bourbon. There's that kind of dusty earth driven style as well. And and we have a couple of single barrels we've released like that. And there's a couple of blends we put out that are closer to that. But for the most part, we like that. really juicy fruit forward louder style of bourbon if you will um that's that's definitely great um talking about finishing a little you know we have the dovetail here and i'm excited about that because i i tapped into our bottle a little early uh because i was so interested in it when i was looking at the label and looking into it not only did i love that proof at 124.7 but the finishing on this is I think something I've never seen before in terms of this combination. And so I definitely want to jump into that. So, yeah, so dovetail, even though the, the biggest driver for us is still our bourbon. uh, I feel that dovetail embodies what our company wants to say about ourselves more completely than anything else we make. Um, Dovetail is a blend of three different ingredients that we are constantly making separately. So each time we vat dovetail, it's somewhere between about 2,000 and 5,000 six packs. Um, and it's always made out of the same three ingredients, but we're, we're constantly producing those ingredients so that we have a sort of variation on how long they were finishing to blend together to keep consistency, but also sort of add complexity. Uh, the base of it, the biggest ingredient is Indiana whiskey that is finished in Dunn Cabernet barrels. And Dunn is uh, one of the f- sort of handful of most well-respected, really old school producers of Cabernet in Napa Valley. They sit on Howell Mountain, which is in the far northeast corner of the valley. Uh, and they are still 100% family owned. Uh, we have this amazing partnership with them where... Uh, Mike Dunn loves our whiskey and we love his empty barrels. And when anyone that works for them wants whiskey, they call us. And when we need empty barrels, we call them. And that's kind of the extent of it. Um, It's just like two family owned companies working together. Uh, The other two ingredients, which were somewhat designed to complement that whiskey are both Tennessee bourbons. One of them is finished in late bottled vintage port pipes. Uh, So you get like a really juicy, grapey, dark fruit kind of quality to that. And, and that complements the cab finish, but the, the juicier part of the cab finish. The other is Tennessee bourbon that's finished in blackstrap molasses rum casks. And so that is that like, oh, I, dirty is not a good word, but that, that like dirty, toasty, uh, like there's some sweetness to it, but it's, it's a burnt sweetness. It's a burnt sugar sweetness. And that complements the like earthiness of the Cabernet finish. Uh, Similarly, the Cabernet finish and the port finish have a level of acidity in them because Cabernet and port are not distilled. So there's still like actually acid present in the barrel and the rum finish and the port finish have a level of sweetness to them because there's residual sugar in both port and black molasses rum. So there's this wonderful balance and play- playfulness of acid and sugar in the whiskey which distract you from the fact that it's 124 proof. And so it's actually a surprisingly easy whiskey to drink, even though it's quite hot. Um, Holy crap. Yeah. 124 proof. Oh my God. You could throw these down, throw an ice cube in here. This is like a cocktail in a glass. Yeah. It's a, it is a dangerous whiskey. And that's a highly dynamic and complex level of blending you guys are doing there from port to Cabernet to rum finishings and to, I mean, that is a very well-balanced equation, however you figured it out. 
uh, I mean, it, this, this goes down a little too smooth. What I, what I love about dovetail is it is of the core line of our products. It is both the most complicated and the easiest at the same time, because if someone just wants a whiskey, it's a pretty objectively delicious whiskey in my mind. It, you don't need to think about it to like it. However, if you wanted to talk to me about the difference between port styles and why we chose late bottled vintage port pipes instead of other styles of port for the finish on one of these ingredients, I could do that too. So the rabbit hole of Dovetail is so deep, wow. um, not to accidentally use another whiskey company's name in, in my description of ours. But, uh, and it actually was inspiring to us that we, we released it almost two years ago now. And it is really part of our core now. If people want us to recommend a whiskey to us, we usually recommend Dovetail. Uh, and we recently released a second whiskey that was a blend of three different finishes called Armida, which is three different bourbons that are all finished separately in pear brandy casks, Sicilian Amaro casks, and Jamaican rum casks. <laughs> um, and wow. that was a pretty limited release because we we had a lot of trouble sort of scaling that up quickly. So it will be part of the core line from us in the middle of next year, but it's quite allocated at the moment. Um, and the response to that was so strong that we actually are releasing a, a rye base that has three finishes on it too. So now we have this family of whiskeys that we're going to start making that each one of them is a blend of three different finishes. Um, and so it's a dovetail was supposed to be this nerdy one-off that we did. It's like, we love this whiskey and like, but no one's going to understand it. It's just going to like, it'll sell out. And then four years from now, there'll be an auction and people will go nuts about it. And instead it became like part of our core offering. Um, and I think part of that is because you don't, you don't, if you don't want to know about it, you can just enjoy it. Um, right. So for me, I got to point this out. I don't know if anyone else is getting this. I definitely pick up the Cabernet and Port influence, particularly more in the back of my palate. But on the palate, I get like such a heavy toasted coconut sweetness. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just phenomenal. I don't know if anyone else is getting that, but that's that is what is really jumping out to me, and I absolutely love it. I'm definitely getting the molasses, and uh, you, you know this. this I agree this, with John this, there. This entire uh, line that we've tasted so far today, to me, is um, is really just reaching out and, ex and expanding the horizon of 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 my enjoyment. I'm 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 old school you know, sweetness forward bourbon dude. And, uh, and suddenly with these that you've brought us and, uh, recently a couple of other tastings we've mm -hmm. done where you guys are, 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 are working the blenders art. And I think you're taste taking those of us that are willing to, um, to, to move away from that gold standard if you if you if you would kentucky you know vanilla forward bourbon into some areas of taste and into new imaginations that you guys have i mean i mean i guess it's your your three folks back there in kentucky have a different idea of what they want to put in a bottle and what they want to put in front of the customer and, and your background uh as the ability to dissect it and describe it is is amazingly good. I'm very impressed uh, that you can take the spirits and 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 move out of the box, if you'll excuse me for that expression. But you really have. But you, but you but you haven't gone crazy with it. I like every one of them. They're all all very good. I, I agree. That's uh really heartwarming things to say. Thank you. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have had to learn this year to be a little louder about ourselves than we had to before because we're not able right now to stand in a store and pour whiskeys for people to try or host. And so it's against my nature and it's sort of against the the company's nature to talk about the awards we win or to advertise or it's, we've really, I think been successful because we keep our heads down and we invest in our own products. Um, but I, this year I've done more and more of these of interviews about the products of, of talking to people about articles that have been written to talking to media, things like that. And uh, it really means a lot to hear someone like you who does not know our brand that well, 
say back to us without being prompted exactly what we want someone to think about us. And so, uh, thank you. You made my day. My my only question is, is the, the enjoyment that we've had today with this tasting is, uh, you know, exponentially more exciting because you are sitting there describing to us what went into it, what you were looking for, and it's what we're tasting. Mm -hmm. Uh, So my question going back to this would be the bartender's best friend, as opposed to necessarily sitting on the shelf of at a liquor store is um, you, my sense is I might not have enjoyed it as much without the benefit of, uh, of your input. So, uh, so, so how can you provide us that input without having to be on a zoom call with everybody every time you want, want them to drink it? So that is, that's the, uh, million dollar marketing question, right? Um, and I am not the person to answer it because I'm, I'm a product first person and, and a sort of communication person. I'm, I'm not a, marketing strategy person by any means, but, uh, my belief and the sort of belief of barrel craft spirits is the first step in answering that is making sure that the, you're telling the true story that you are producing a whiskey that is worthy of having good things said about it. And then you're finding the most digestible or listen toable way of communicating the real story. Uh, the second and harder step is finding the arena to, to tell that story. Um, and also figuring out how to do it in a way that is easy to remember and is easy to reproduce so that my hope would be that if you're talking to someone about dovetail four months from now, you might not remember that it's black strap molasses rum or late bottle vintage port, but you might remember that it's a blend of three whiskeys that we make all the time. Um, or that it's, you know, high proof, but it's sweet and a little bit tart. And because of that, easy to drink. Uh, for me going from working in, in fine wine where almost every touch point in sales was long, uh, and usually with people that really knew the the products and the history around them really well to working for a whiskey company where I get to do this sometimes, but I also do a lot of, I have 10 minutes and there are some bullet points that I need to make sure everyone here knows situations is starting really long, starting really wide and making sure that we as a company not only understand how we made our products, but also what makes them special to us and what makes them special to the people that like them. And then finding ways to boil that down more and more and more so that in the event that we do have only four bullet points to give someone, we give them the right bullet points. Um, and then there's just the work of getting it in front of people that, uh, especially with dovetail and our batches of bourbon, we really feel like the, we can get people who'd like whiskey to drink it. The company's going to grow naturally. Um, because we just really stand behind the, pro- the the whiskey and like as much as, as we wouldn't release, Joe doesn't let anything out the door that he doesn't taste and say, this, ha- this has my name on it. And part um, two of that, I think is, is, is convincing the consumer uh, that there are wider horizons and that they can venture out a little bit and open up their minds to what they're, what they're willing to accept uh, alongside that bourbon. Or, or weeded bourbon as you started out earlier. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's also really difficult because uh, when people are making decisions about what they drink, a lot of times it, it people are are not drinking to explore. It's for comfort or for tradition. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it is it is hard to tell someone who just wants their doers to drink anything but doers because that's what they're looking for in that experience is not tasting something new and thinking about it. They're looking for the thing that they trust and feels good to them. Uh, and, and the brand that for however many years has really invested in making them feel a certain way about it. Um, what we try to do from a production, but then also marketing and, and, I don't like using the phrase storytelling because it makes it sound like we're not telling the real story, but a storytelling standpoint is 
if you are looking for an exciting thing to try, we want to over deliver for the money that you spent on our brand. If someone is spending 65 or 84 or 99 or however many dollars it is on our bottle, we want someone to be wowed by what they got for that money. Um, similarly, we don't want someone to taste our whiskey and say, okay, that's interesting and put it back on the shelf. And that's the end of it. We want to be a, a whiskey producer that people like to drink that we, we don't produce whiskeys to be interesting in a library. We produce whiskeys to be nice to share and to drink. And so because of that, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, even though we experiment a lot, our whiskeys are actually not that far outside of the box when you taste them. They're just that far outside of the box in the way that we blend them and the level of like the depth of transparency we give about the way that it's finished and put together. Um, Cause we want, we want dovetail to be a whiskey that like you buy and you, you sit down with it with your friends and you accidentally go through the whole bottle because it's really good. Um, well, you're selling them all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't see a problem there. I, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're fortunately, our bottle is not that full because if if it were, I think John and I might be getting an uh, Uber home. Um, but yeah, that is uh, that is. I, I don't have an answer to the question because it it is a. It's a hard thing to do. It's an even harder thing to do respectfully, and it's. Uh, we have found that we need to keep our head down and make the best whiskey we can. And then we need to ship away at finding more and more people to taste it. Because if we do it in that order, people trust us and the whiskey speaks for itself. And that is much, that lasts much longer and makes much more of an impression than making a lot of promises about what your whiskey is going to be. And then hoping that someone feels that way about it. Uh, well, I think y'all are, are doing such a great job and, you know, I know we're excited to, to try more and, and have the opportunity to talk with you more. Um, Will, we really can't thank you enough for taking your time today. You know, we, we enjoy doing this so much and we enjoy learning with every experience. And I definitely felt like I learned a little today just in terms of, of how much I can enjoy something that like the dovetail that maybe would have made me step back a little bit when right. I was reading the label, but you know, it was so impressive to me, particularly at that proof point. And, uh, you know, that, that's exactly what I need to expand my horizon. So, all right, well, well we know we got to let you go. Uh, <laughs> thank you again, but uh, cheers to you and, and barrels craft spirits. So many good things happening and we just really look forward to the future. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Hey everyone, thanks again for tuning in to the Capital City Bourbon Show. We have more great episodes planned for you in the future, so come back and join us on the porch. Cheers, y'all.